Good afternoon, professors, doctors, and all health professionals. Thank you for joining with us in Kalbe International Webinar Series. My name is Lina. I'm a product manager of medical nutrition specialty class in Kalbe International. The topic for today's webinar is the rule of nutrition in COVID-19, what the guidelines say. So we will discuss about the practical guidance of nutrition during COVID-19 pandemic. This topic was chosen carefully because we are now fully feeling the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. And the more important things are to do preventive action and limit the spread. One of the preventive action is to keep our immune system strong and good nutrition is one of the components to keep our immune system strong. This topic will be presented by Dr. Dedianto Henki Saputra. He is a master of clinical nutrition, graduate of the Indonesia University and active in Indonesian Doctors Association as editorial board The enriched nutrition to enhance immune system because nutrition is contain high energy, high protein, BCAA, omega-3, fructooligosaccharide as prebiotic, and vitamins, minerals. For answer session, we will answer some question at the end of so. Don't hesitate to put or to type your comment or question in comment section. So without further ado, I will pass the screen to Dr. Dedi. Please, Dr. Dedi, you may start your presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Lina. Uh, please give me time to share my slide presentation. Yes. Can you see in the, in the screen? Doctor. Okay. Okay, can I start now, okay? Yeah, you can start. Okay. Good day, doctor and college. Thank you for joining this webinar session. Uh, today I will present a webinar topic with the title, The Role of Nutrition in COVID-19 Infection Management. Uh, what's practical guidance say COVID-19 uh, as we know is a severe uh, acute respiratory disease that caused a global pandemic and become a serious public uh, health problem. The one manifestation that can cure from COVID-19 infection is a nutritional status disorder. The critical ill condition in patients treated with COVID-19 infection are in very stressful condition. So this causes a high risk malnutrition and also require comprehensive management, including nutrition intervention. And also for patients positive for COVID-19 infection in mild, moderate to severe states also require clinical nutrition intervention as a part of medical service. Based on the above observation prevention, diagnosis and treatment of malnutrition, should be considered the management of COVID-19 patients to improve both short and also long-term prognosis. So until now, there's still no official guideline in management that used globally for COVID-19 infection. However, the local practice guidance, uh, as well as those reported by ASPER and also as ASPER, have been published to help clinicians a nutritional uh, treatment to be more directed based on the pathological status experienced by the patient. This guidance is created based on current ASPEN and ASPEN guidance and also from Indonesian Clinical Nutrition Association practice guidance uh, that have been published in April 2020 and also for their expert advice. 
Um, there's no directed study on nutrition management in COVID-19 infection. So the following consideration can be currently only be based on the base knowledge and clinical experience. Systematically, the material that I will present will be divided into three parts. The first part is to explain malnutrition as a risk in COVID-19 patient. And then after that, I will present uh, the topic about the guidance, what the, the practical guidance say. And at the end of the session, uh, we'll be wrapped up with the summary. Let's uh, go to the first topic, malnutrition risk in COVID-19 patient. So you can see the factor, factor contributes of increased risk of malnutrition in COVID-19 patient is uh, multifactorial. The first factor is uh, the increment, the increment energy and the second is inadequate, inadequate food intake and the other factor are also the therapeutic effect and also intoleration of the therapy that being given to the patient. Increased energy requirement are caused by the increasing work by the respiratory muscle and also mechanical ventilation, whereas the loss of the tide, deep snow, and also mechanical ventilation, decrease of consciousness of the patient are other factors that cause the inadequate intake in, in patient. And drug or nutrition intolerance such also can induce uh, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and other GI tract dysfunction. And this condition will cause the malabsorption and also loss of nutrients in patient with COVID-19 infection. Nutrition, nutrition status and prognosis of patients also have correlation with the prognosis of patients infected with COVID-19 virus. Some nutritional markers that have influence on patient prognosis, including hypoalbuminemia, the high BMI, BMI score, lymphopenia, and also low, uh, uh, low prealbumin level. The high level of BMI here as a factor that worsen the prognosis show the role of sarcopenia in obesity as a factor influencing patient outcome. So that's why to maintain better nutritional status on patient should create a better prognosis. The following are the, the, the this slide uh, is uh, following are the various metabolism uh, changes that occur in patients who have COVID-19 patient, uh, COVID-19 infection in terms of changes in carbohydrate, protein, and also fat metabolism. Change in protein metabolism can be seen through protein breakdown, the increment of acute passive phase protein synthesis and also decrease muscle protein synthesis and also changes in amino acid profile such as the loss of brain chain amino acid from muscle, from muscle. BCA is known to be a muscle amino acid that is broken down in starvation condition and to become an alternative energy source through alanine glucose cycle. Whereas the current Whereas in carbohydrate metabolism, uh, there is also a decrease in glucose oxidation, energy supply, and also increased gluconeogenesis uh, uh, due, due to fat, lactate, and protein that are being broken down, accompanied by insulin resistance and also an increase in blood glucose level. These metabolic changes also happening in fat where mobilization and breakdown of fat being used as other alternative energy source. So all these metabolic changes can explain the increased daily energy requirement of patients infected with COVID-19 virus. And besides change in nutritional metabolism, um, patients infected with COVID-19 also have a risk experience with electrolyte and also homeostasis 
imbalance. You can see here, COVID virus bind to S2 receptor in, patient, uh, in human and increase the degradation of S2 and then decrease the action of counteract S2 of renin angiotensin system or, or we, we know it as a RAS. This will induce the increment of absorption of sodium and also water that will increase the blood pressure and potassium excretion. Patients infected with COVID-19 virus also, also often experience genetic disorder such as this, the diarrhea and also vomiting. And both of these conditions become things that will cause disruption on electrolyte balance, pH, and also homeostasis, especially hypokalemia. In this picture, we can see the vicious cycle of infection as, and also malnutrition as a two-way interaction. Malnutrition and infection operate in vicious mutual synergism. Malnutrition increases risk, severity, and mortality of infection. Infection reduces the nutrition nutrient and impact in the patient and also interfere with substrate utilization and promote the tissue and also protein breakdown. In this cyclical manner, it's exacerbated the effect to the other. So approaching the, these two problems together is therefore become paramount importance. Poor or calm are the likely if either side of this, this equation is being ignored. This slide or describe the interplay between malnutrition uh, enteric dysfunction and also the, the systemic inflammation related to immune system patient, the exposure of intestinal pathogen and intestinal dysbiosis here we can see here as a consequence possibly specific nutrient deficiency lead to intestinal inflammation and disruption of intestinal barrier function. Impaired barrier function allow the trans translocation in intestine, which activate the innate immune cell in the mesentery, lymph nodes, liver, and systemic circulation to generate pro-inflammatory cytokine. The increased systemic inflammation and then carries a metabolic cause and leads to impair the host events. So collectively, the, this vicious cycle lead to growth filtering and increase the mortality. So, until now, official guidelines have not yet been published as a nutrition guide for patients with COVID-19. But nonetheless, local practical guidance, such those issued by Indonesian Clinical Nutrition Association, or PDGI, as well as by Ispen and Aspen, have been prepared to facilitate clinicians in providing better nutrition therapy or treatment. These guidance are based on preliminary research as well as exciting evidence based from nutritional intervention of other pathological conditions that have similar as pathological condition experience in patients infected with COVID-19 virus. So let's first take, let's uh, talk about the energy. First, uh, the number calorie given to the patient should be calculated based on nutritional status, clinical, and also the presence of comor comorbid disease. For Indonesian Clinical Nutrition Association recommend 30 until 35 kilocalories per kilogram body weight per day to be given for confirmed, probable, or suspect case, and also for geriatric patient. 
How about for, uh, the calorie for health worker? For the health worker can be given based on the needs of the ARDA aided by 10%. For patient with polymorbid, as Penn defined the needs of total energy expenditure based on the patient nutritional stages. Patient with polymorbid condition with uh, age over 65 years old can be supported energy at 27 kilocalorie per kilogram body weight per day, whereas patient with polymorbid condition with severe malnutrition stages can be supported energy at 30 kilocalorie per kilogram body weight per day. Remember, in this condition, the provision of the nutrition must be done with cautiously and slowly achieved as at high risk of repeating syndrome. Let's next talk about the carbohydrate. The carbohydrate can be given in the amount of 50 until 60 of the total daily energy need. Please, uh, the profit, the to consider the, the provision of carbohydrate must be consider, considered uh, by patient resp respiratory condition and also the comor comorbid disease such as diabetic mellitus patient. Giving glucose in excessive amount may increase the blood glucose and also CO2 production and fat synthesis and also increase the insulin requirement. So for the fat and carbohydrate needs are adapted by the energy need while considering an energy ratio from fat and carbohydrate between 30 compared to 70 until 50 compared to 50. 50 compared to 50 is usually used for pace for ventilated patient. Uh, the, this, is, this is about protein. The protein can be given as much as 1.2 until 2 gram per kilogram per kilogram body weight per day, or uh, re, uh, around 15 until 25 of total energy requirement. Please remember that giving protein in excess of 2 gram per kilogram body weight per day will not add provide clinical benefit and does not address protein catabolism. And we must note it that provision of protein must also consider the kidney function of the patient. As Penn recommend the, the giving protein of one gram per kilogram body weight per day in elderly and in the medical polymorbid patient. In patient, protein can be given more than one gram per kilogram per body weight per day. And in patients with well-functioned GI tract, the high-calorie whole protein preparation can be given. Uh, this slide uh, uh, can show that providing protein with a higher dose than due to an increase in protein catabolism, protein also have a role in optimizing the work of the immune system. In this image, we can see that the protein, the whey protein supplement enhance, enhance the glutathione in various tissue with turn to maintain the muscle glutamine reservoir. Glutathione is the keystone of the body cellular antioxidant defense system and also regulate many aspects of immune function. BCAA as one type of amino acid, which is part of protein, besides being needed to prevent muscle wasting by restoring resolve in the muscle, also have a role in the mechanism of the immune system. BCA optimize proliferation lymphoid cell, enhance the function of neutrophil phagocyte, and also natural killer lymphocyte cell activity, increase plasma glutamine concentration, and also improve inflammatory condition by increasing the breakdown of pro-inflammatory factors such as CRP, alkaline phosphate, and gamma glutamine transferase. By increasing the, the breakdown pro-inflammatory factor, this will 
be uh, uh, repair the the high inflammation condition in patient with uh, COVID-19 virus infection. In addition, uh, BCA also have other role in maintaining the barrier immune system in digestive tract. The GI tract is known as important barrier to the entry of pathogen in patient to the opportunistic in patient that are often experienced by patient with insufficient food intake due to intestinal epithelial atrophy. So we can see here in the in this unit that optimal BCA ratio would improve the intestinal morphology and cell proliferation, increase intestinal amino acid absorption through mediating expression of intestinal amino acid transporter and also promote intestinal protection. In this image, we can see the difference of fill height and depth here between unbalanced and balanced BCA. Higher fill with lower depth provide a better picture of intestinal barrier defense. The, this is a, about uh, the, uh, the fat recommendation. The recommend uh, amount of fat intake is between 20 and uh, 25 until 30 percent of the total daily energy. It is said that certain types of fat have antiviral effect. However, those and amount being given is still required for the research. And one type of fat that said that have a specific effect. On human system, human immune system is omega three and also omega nine. This picture describes the role of omega three in uh, immune system mechanism. You can see in this picture. Well, it says that omega three has a role in natural immune system as well as in acquired immune system. In, in that immune system, you can see here, omega-3 has impact on decreasing migration and, and increasing phagocyte activity of neutrophil and macrophag, as well as decreasing dendritic cell presentation. In adaptive immune system, omega-3 increases the production of IgM, <coughs> B-cell, and also T regulate, regulator from T cell. It also decreased the amount of proliferation, cytokine, and also TS17 from T cell. You can see here. In patients with COVID-19 infection, there is an increased need for vitamin and also uh, the mineral. The micronutrient requirement depends on the patient condition, whether there are signs of deficiency and consider needs of anti-inflammatory, also antioxidant, immunonutrition, with prey on probiotic. Some recommend micronutrients in COVID-19 patients are listed in this table, you can see in this slide, which, uh, which is vitamin C administration in severe cases of COVID-19 or with complication is recommended being given in intravenously because the effect is 10 times most 10 times stronger than being given orally see here this is the the, the dose that we can that can be given to the patient the the, the high dose of vitamin c and uh, we can see also here the provision of zinc uh, in, in in vitro study result increase increase the intracellular concentration <coughs> Of zinc two, such as zinc two ionophore, such as uh, pyrithion, which can disrupt the coronavirus replication efficiency. The following is the statement issued uh, by the Chinese government as the recommended high dose with vitamin C, with those varying depending on the patient disease degree. Doses in the range of between 50 and 200 milligram per kilogram body weight per day can be given, which means a total four and 16 gram given per day can be given safely, effectively, and has a broad spectrum as an antiviral effect. 
This is in the landscape of how is the zinc effect on immune cell. Zinc is integral part of a thymic hormone uh, molecule as stimulin. Stimulin is required for maturation of the T cell. A zinc deficiency induced decrease in stimulin activity associated with decreased maturation of T cell and the helper one production and also interleukin 2 and interferon gamma and decrease inter interleukin 2 decrease natural killer and T cytotoxic cell activity macrophag monocyte produce interleukin which along with interferon gamma killed parasite virus and bacteria so zinc deficiency also lead to stress and activation of macrophag monocyte resulting increased generation of inflammatory cytokine such as interleukin beta, interleukin 6, interleukin 8, and also TNF alpha. This image describes the role of vitamin D in the immune system. The dendritic cells are the anti proxion antigen presently presenting cell that initiate response to cellular immunity and also humoral immunity. So the differentiation and maturation of dendritic cell and maturation is influenced by vitamin D. Vitamin D has the effect inhibiting the differentiation of monocyte cell to dendritic cell and inhibit the process of dendritic cell maturation then maintain the dendritic cell in immature condition so this condition will increase the pathogen killing activity of the dendritic cell the vitamin d also inhibit the activation of dendritic t dependent uh, in t cell and decrease the secretion of the helper one and two cytokine and induce the development of regulatory of T cell. This is one evidence that show effect of vitamin D supplementation to reduce risk of COVID-19 infection and that that been published in Nutrient Journal in April 2020 said that to reduce risk of infection it is recommended that people at risk of influenza and or COVID-19 consider taking 10,000 youth international units per day of vitamin D3 for a week rapidly rise to uh, the concentration of vitamin D in the body and followed by 5,000 uh, international units per day that the goal should be raised the, the concentration of vitamin D in the body above between 60 and between 40 and 60 nanogram per milliliter. <clears throat> For treatment of people who become infected with COVID-19, so the higher vitamin D3 dose might be useful. In some, in some patients COVID-19 uh, with COVID-19 infection, the GI tract disorder also occurs such as abdominal pain and diarrhea. This directly caused by viral infection and of the intestinal mucose, uh, uh, and also because the administration of antiviral drug and uh, the, the treatment of antibiotic. This condition will increase risk dehydration in COVID-19 patients. So giving fluid must be considered so as not excessive because if the administration of food is too aggressive, it can aggravate the condition of respiratory distress oxygenation. So the purpose of giving adequate food under this condition is attempt to prevent dehydration or excess food. So it will be the how to maintain the food balance. So food is based on food balance and and also urine output, the present or absence of edema and hemodynamic. So we can see in this table the isotonic crystalloid or normal saline, also or ringle like that, can be given 
in the amount of between 30 until 35 milliliters per kilogram body weight per day and giving food in the form resuscitation can be given within in the first three hours and patient enter the uh, hospital. And also we, we have noticed that normal colon, normal kalemia in patient are given uh, a fluid infusion containing potassium at dose between 36 until 72 millimoles per day, whereas in patient with hypokalemia or hypopotassemia are adjusted to the patient condition. If there is an increase of blood pressure during treatment, a low salt diet can be considered. Patients with severe acute respiratory syndrome who have been categorized in critical condition or as severe uh, is a higher risk nutritional disorder. So early evaluation of nutritional risk examination of GI tract function and also as aspiration risk should be carried out. The use and role can be also be taken into consideration according to the patient condition. So we can see here, patient can be given calorie in the amount between 25 and 30 uh, kilocalorie per kilogram body weight per day. And for the protein, uh, around 1.3 kilogram per body weight per day. And glucose from parenteral nutrition or carbohydrate from enteral nutrition should not exceed then five milligram per kilogram but body weight per minute or should not 1.5 gram per kilogram body weight <clears throat> and also it is not recommended to give IV fat emulsion with basic ingredient of soybean oil or soybean oil base patient patient with GI tract disorder should be given the type of pre-digested short chain peptide preparation and if the patient have adequate GI tract function so the high calorie whole protein preparation can be given in the acute phase do not give calorie exceeding more than 70 percent of total energy uh, expenditure and after three days then we can increase the energy into 80 until 100 percent uh, this is the flow of nutrition delivery in patient admitted to the hospital with COVID-19 infection can be seen in this in this picture uh, we can see here if the inadequate uh, GI tract function are formed so the the parenteral route or parent parenteral route can be chosen either is uh, peripherally or centrally based on the duration that uh, the, 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 the parental nutrition that will be given. And also we have to consider the osmolarity of the parental nutrition. If more than uh, 900 mil osmo, so it should be given centrally to reduce the, 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 the risk of uh, uh, plebitis in patient. And if the tract system has returned to adequate nutrition, uh, treatment can be given back to orally on, or uh, enterally. So if from the beginning, the function of GI tract uh, system is adequate and the patient has contraindication to being given uh, orally. So we can see here, the enteral route can be, enteral, uh, route can be uh, chosen while being evaluated and every uh, 72 hours, the intake is less than 60% uh, of the daily calorie target, then a combination with uh, parenteral nutrition can be considered in this patient. Uh, this is the one brain of enteral nutrition product uh, that can be selected uh, in COVID uh, condition, in COVID infection condition. Uh, the brand is Nutrican. Nutrican it has a high energy content. We can see here, per serving, Nutrican can, can, can uh, give uh, 340 kilocalorie with density uh, 
1.36 kilokalori per milliliter. Nutrien also uh, contain or BCAA and have high protein. High protein. You can see here uh, 18 gram uh, protein per serving, and also high BCAA uh, per serving uh, content is around uh, five gram BCAA. And also other uh, uh, specific nutrients such as omega-3, prebiotic, and some trace element and vitamin, they have antioxidant effect. The BCAA and omega also has an uh, effect on enhanced immune system and also to improve the, the appetite of the patient and also to reduce inflammation for omega-3 in a COVID-19 patient that we know have a uh, 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 inflammation, uh, inflammation store or uh, cytokine storm in, while they are uh, being infected by the COVID-19 virus. Uh, this is a few things to consider during monitoring phase, include the patient consciousness, intake response, uh, by assessing the number of calorie target being achieved as well as the amount of the residual um, uh, volume uh, that being if the, the nutrition being given to NGT uh, the residual volume is measured every 24 hours if the volume is less uh, than um, 500 milliliter per 24 hour then uh, the nutrition to enteral root can be continued for hemodynamic uh, also need to be considered if it become unstable, then nutritional therapy can be postponed temporarily. Likewise, the fluid balance uh, to be evaluated also every 24 hours and some laboratory parameters such as blood glucose, electrolyte, urea creatinine, blood glass, blood glass, blood gas analysis, albumin, albumin, and also lipid profile are should monitor if needed. As a wrap-up, I like to summarize uh, the net. The, the topic that has been presented the COVID 19 infection induce the change in nutrition metabolism. Worse, some nutrition status will have a negative impact on patient prognosis. Therefore, with better nutrition status, it will provide better immunity status for patient and several types of nutrients provide beneficial effect of maintaining the immune system either directly or indirectly such as the, the protein, BCAA, uh, zinc, and omega-3, and, uh, uh, and, and other else. Uh, nutri nutrition management should be given based on patient hemodynamic, hemodynamic and also nutritional, clinical, and comorbid uh, status. And also don't forget the uh, GI tract acceptance of the of the patient. Uh, so that's bring us to the end. I'd like to thank you for your time and also your attention today. Thank you again. So I will uh, let the session to dinner, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dedi, for the informative presentation. Now we are going to the next session, which is Q&A session. This session is divided into two sections, and there are two questions of each section. For the first section, there are two questions. The first question is from Myanmar, from Mr. Han Wintun. The question is, is there any recommended dose of BCAA to enhance immune system. And the second question is from Philippine, Mampeng Pantaleon. There shows, uh, that there is a correlation immune system and dysbiosis condition. Is there any benefit to give probiotic and prebiotic? To Dr. Dedi, please answer the question. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Lina. I try to answer the first uh, question regarding the recommend recommend 
uh, dose for BCAA to enhance immune system. So uh, until now, there's still no recommendation for BCAA regarding to improve immune system. But uh, in one study that uh, I've read before, uh, that being conducted in healthy people who are uh, conditioned in uh, stress by, by doing heavy exercise, uh, in this study, uh, BCA was given uh, around 12, 12 grams per day uh, to prevent the lowering uh, plasma of uh, glutamine concentration. We know the glutamine is amino acid that is needed to intestinal barrier integrity. So uh, BCA in, in, in the same study also uh, allow uh, an increase uh, some response for uh, lymphocyte and as well as uh, increased production of interleukin uh, one and also interleukin two and also TNF alpha and interferon. So this possibly linked to the lower incidence of symptom uh, of infection in a patient that being given with BCA. So uh, the, the dose around uh, 12 gram per day in, in that study, but uh, the, 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 recommend, the, rec the recommendation uh, dose uh, has not been stated until now for uh, enhanced immune system. I hope that that, that can answer the, 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 the question. Okay, and then uh, next is uh, the, 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 the question about the, 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 the diet, this biosis condition, yeah, this biosis the condition and uh, correlation with the immune system. So uh, we can see that the microbiota imbalance uh, was reported in COVID-19 patients, uh, such as a decrease in the number of uh, lactobacillus and also bifidobacterium. Both of, uh, of them we know as a microflora that they maintain the healthy uh, gut in, uh, in uh, GI tract of human body. So the probiotic or prebiotic are given to reduce the bacterial translocation and also to prevent the secondary infection. So probiotic or prebiotic can be considered because it's expected to increase the, the, the amount of microflora and also to inhibit the growth of uh, patho, uh, bacteria pathogen or pathogenic bacteria by reducing the production of toxin or also to reduce infection caused by dysbiosis condition. So this can improve sy symptom of GI tract disorder in patient. So, and also to reduce the fluid in the stool uh, that can be happen in diarrhea condition and also uh, to improve the texture of the stool and the uh, frequency of bowel movement. So by giving pro or prebiotic it can inhibit the intestinal mucosa atrophy also. So probiotic and prebiotic are considered especially in patients using antibiotic also. Uh, we can see here the patient uh, you, you mean the, the, the amount, yeah? The, for the probiotic is uh, depend on the strength. But as I read in the, the recommendation uh, in Indonesian Clinical Association, uh, it is uh, stated that uh, they, uh, they recommend the lactobacillus in amount uh, uh, one, 1 billion until 10 billion uh, colony forming unit per, per day. For the, the, the lactobacillus uh, probiotic. And for uh, prebiotic, it depends on what kind of the probiotic. Uh, for example, for, for fructo oligosaccharide or uh, galacto oligosaccharide, uh, can be supplemented at least uh, five grams per day to, to maintain the, the, the GI tract health. So actually, the, the probiotic and prebiotic can be, uh, can be given uh, together because they work uh, support each other. Probiotic is the, the, the food for the probiotic. By giving the food, 
uh, we can enhance the amount of probiotic in uh, in uh, in human uh, GI tract. I hope uh, I think I hope that can answer the question. Five gram, five gram, five gram for uh, fruto oligosaccharide or uh, galacto oligosaccharide. Okay. Yeah. So for BCA is twelve gram per day. So and probiotic is uh, one to ten billion colony for unit, and for prebiotic is five grams per day. Okay. Thank you, doctor, for the answers. So we are going now to the second section of Q and A session. There are Two questions from Mr. Indika Bandara. Is there any benefit from uh, for omega-3 for COVID-19? And the second question is what kind of tools should be used to access nutritional status to COVID-19 patients? This question is from Vietnam, from Ms. Min Tu. Please, Dr. Dedi, answer uh, the questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I, I will try to answer the, uh, the third question uh, regarding the omega-3 role in the immune system. Actually, I already explained in my previous slide, uh, uh, I've been saying that uh, omega-3 uh, has a role both in innate or adaptive immune system. In innate immune system, omega-3 uh, work uh, by increasing the activity of phagocytosis of uh, neutrophil and also macrophage, and also decrease the presentation of uh, dendritic cell. By decrease the presentation of dendritic cell, we will increase the bacteria or, or pathogen killing activity. And for our adaptive immune system, uh, omega 3 has a role in T cell or B cell. For B cell, it will increase the production of uh, immunoglobulin M, and for T cell, will uh, increase the activity of uh, T-regular. I think uh, it answered the, the, the role of omega-3 in uh, immune system. And the next question is the, 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 the tools that can be used for, to assess nutrition status in COVID-19 patients. So, if I if we see the, the recommendation based on SPAN or Indonesian Clinical Nutrition Association. It is recommended to use uh, two tools to assess the nutrition, nutrition of the first is the MUSD or MUS, MUSD, and the second one is NRS 2002. Because both of these tools have been uh, long used and validated in general practice or in a specific disease setting or condition for mal malnutrition screening. So, uh, and also uh, a recent uh, document globally endorsed by Clinical Nutrition Society worldwide has introduced the, the GLIM. GLIM is Global Leadership Initiative on Malnutrition. So this is uh, another tool that can create a criteria for malnutrition diagnosis. Yet. So the GLIM proposed a two-step approach for malnutrition diagnosis. First is screening to identify a risk status. Uh, and the second one is to assess diagnosis and grading the severity of malnutrition. So there actually now there are two um, MUSD or NRS 2002, and also the new one that has been proposed is a global leadership initiative on malnutrition or GLIM. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dedi, for the answers. Uh, because we have limited time, so for the other question, we will answer the other question by email. So uh, we are going to do the next session is summary. So I will try to make a summary regarding nutrition requirement in COVID-19 infection management yeah, to 
enhance uh, the immune system. So the patient need be around 30 to 35 kilocalorie per kg body weight per day, and macronutrients consist of carbohydrates around 50 to 60 of total energy requirement, but please consider about the respiratory condition and comorbid diabetes. For protein, it's 15 to 25 percent of total energy requirements are around 1.2 grams per kg body weight per day. And please consider about the patient's kidney function. And for the last macronutrients is fat, around 25 to 30 percent of total energy requirements. And the patient also need micronutrients such uh, consists of vitamins A, B, B1, B6, uh, C, D, and E, and also mineral min minerals like uh, selenium, zinc. For fluid, uh, the, the requirement is uh, 30 to milliliter per kg body weight per day. And the type of fluid is isotonic crystalloid or normal saline or finger lactate. To enhance the immune system or to optimize the immune system, the patient needs specific nutrients such as BCAA, and also prebiotic to reduce BCAA disturbance. Uh, to help the patient to fulfill this requirement, I would like to share our best product from Calbe is Nutrican. Nutrican is the enriched nutrition to enhance immune system because of nutrican content 340 kilocalories per serving. Uh, this high, uh, high energy content can provide energy to fight, in, to fight the infection and uh, with high protein, 18 gram per serving can improve or can enhance the immune system such as IgG antibodies and glutathione and improve the albumin level. Content specific nutrients such as BCAA, five gram per serving, to enhance the immune system, such as lymphocyte and natural killer cell and improve the patient appetite. And the second specific nutrients is omega-3, 0.9 gram per serving, to enhance the innate and adaptive immune system. And uh, Third specific nutrients is fructooligosaccharide as prebiotic, three grams per serving, can improve the immune profile such as lymphocyte and reduce the GI disturbance. And nutrition completed with vitamins and minerals like selenium, zinc, and also calcium to reduce risk of infection and help to boost uh, immune system. The recommended dosage of Nutrican is two to three servings per day. So hopefully Nutrican can be your choice for your, immu your patient's immune system and can be used uh, orally and also to feeding. Thank you. Uh, so finally, we come to the last session of this webinar. So I would like to say thank you to Dr. Dedi for the informative presentation and to all audiences for the active participation. Hopefully, the information that we have shared today can be useful for all of us. So please stay healthy and active during COVID-19 pandemic and see you in the next webinar. Thank you.